Welcome to Kingdom Honor Session 8. This is the bonus session, the Q&A. Over the last several weeks, we have collected questions from many people that, that have gone through the course or that have gone through the book that they just wanted clarity on or, or you wanted um, some understanding. So we have about 12 questions we're going to cover here, and I'm excited. So let's dive right into this. The first question, how do I deal with rebellion on my team? Okay, so I talked about this earlier. Let's talk about two things. If you're the ministry leader, number one, you have to address it. You have to confront it. You cannot allow minis- You cannot allow a spirit of rebellion to spread. Okay, this is something I struggled with early on in my 20s. I was very timid. I didn't like confrontation. Most people don't like. Who who likes confrontation, right? No one does. However, as a leader, you have to do it. You can't avoid it. That's one of the the roles of being a leader. You have to confront things. You have to bring things to light. So. I want, to, I want to encourage you, those of you that are ministry leaders, confront it on your team. Do not think it'll disappear. Do not think it'll fade away. Address the individual, share with them, and allow God to use you and minister to them to bring healing. And if there's repentance, amazing. And if there's not, then they need to step down for a season, okay? Allow God to work on them, but they shouldn't keep serving in ministry or have a leadership position or anything if they still have a spirit of rebellion. Now, for those of you that maybe you're asking this question and you're like, I'm not the pastor, I'm not the the ministry leader, but I'm noticing rebellion on my team. What do I do? You also have to confront it. You're also accountable to protecting the culture of your team. You need to take that responsibility. If there's someone on your, your team that is negatively, and maybe they're complaining, maybe they're negative, maybe they're criticizing a leader, and it's impacting you, or you're noticing impacting your department, you need to go to them. Go to them as a brother, go to them as a sister, and just let them know. Because you know what? They may not even see it. They may not know how it's impacting or affecting you. So hold them accountable. Remember I told you about the friend that held me accountable when I criticized my former pastor? I was so glad he did. He shut it down, and I never did that again. But, and that's because he held me accountable. So you be that strong brother. Remember, speak the truth, but in love. You want to be a real brother? You want to be a real sister? It's holding each other accountable. You don't want to see them be detoured. You don't want to see them be delayed. You don't want to see them lose their calling or miss out on what God has for them. So protect them, love them, speak the truth in love, and God will bring healing on your team. Now you be the one, plant seeds of honor, sow seeds of honor, be that vessel. Remember Paul said in Romans, he said, outdo one another in showing honor. So you keep planting seeds of honor in your team and watch what God does. Question number two, when do I not obey a leader? Okay, this is a great question because in King number five, I talk about obeying your leaders, right? Hebrews 13 says, obey your spiritual leaders. But the question does come up, when do I not obey? And I want to be very clear on this because the Bible is clear. And that is this, it does not matter what position of authority they hold. You do not, under any circumstance, obey a leader that is instructing or commanding you to sin. I'm going to say that again. It doesn't matter what position of authority they hold. You do not, under any circumstance, submit to an authority figure asking you to sin. Okay? Don't ever forget that. Let me share with you this verse in Proverbs here. It says, If the godly give in to the wicked, it's like polluting a fountain or muddying a spring. Isn't that crazy? Look at that again. If the godly give in to the wicked, it's like polluting a fountain or muddying a spring. So whatever. Do not give in to sin, no matter what. It doesn't matter... what leader it is in your life. It doesn't matter what position they hold. You never compromise this. There's a couple examples in the Bible. You look at Joseph. He was tempted by Potiphar's wife to sleep with her. He didn't submit. He ran, right? He honored God. You look at um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were ordered by their leader to bow down to the statue. They didn't bow. They honored God. You look at Daniel. King Darius rolled out a national law against prayer, right? He did not submit to that. He still prayed three times a day. You look at the early disciples. They were ordered to stop preaching. They did not submit to that law. They kept preaching the gospel. They said, should we obey you rather than God? So remember, follow God. Follow kingdom law, kingdom principles. You never violate kingdom law. And it's sad to say, over the last couple years, there have been multiple prominent ministry leaders that have been exposed for having sexual relationships, mishandling ministry finances, or other immoral behavior. And this is truly heartbreaking. 
And uh, this is why Paul, look, look at what he tells his young assistant, Timothy. Look at this. He said, you should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be very difficult times. They will act religious, but they will reject the power that can make them godly. Stay away from people like that. Okay, so you can see you don't stay under leadership that is asking you to sin or is leading you to sin. You just don't compromise in those areas. Paul also tells this to the Corinthian church. Look at this, 1 Corinthians 5. Now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or an extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. Now, let me make it clear. Paul is not talking about unbelievers, not at all. He's talking about those who call themselves Christians, but choose to live this lifestyle of sin. Okay. So Paul is not talking about staying away from unbelievers, but rather those that call themselves Christians who live in sin, who make excuses and who justify it. Okay. If you are under a ministry leader who is tempting you to sin or is asking you to sin, you are not to submit to that leader. Paul encountered this in Galatians chapter 2. Remember he said false brethren crept into the church and their goal was to bring us back into bondage again. Remember that? And what did he say? Look at this response right here. Galatians chapter 2. He said, we did not yield submission even for an hour that the truth of the gospel might continue with us, that might continue with you. And it's critical we follow Paul's example. Don't submit, not even for a moment, not even for an hour. You do not submit when someone is trying to bring you back into bondage again, okay? Now, I realize there are many different situations and different scenarios where your ministry leader could cross the line, or maybe there, there's things that aren't right, and you know in your heart something is not right. I wanna tell you this, go to another pastor for counseling, go to another pastor for direction. This is if you are being led to sin, okay? I want you to right away, go get counseling, go get um, mentorship that you need on how to handle this situation and how to navigate this season, okay? But no matter what, you do not compromise or fall into sin, okay? You be the vessel who God has called you to be. The next question, question number three. The question is, what do I do if I'm under abusive authority? Okay, this is a good question, and I hope you never experience this in ministry, but maybe you experience it in the workplace, maybe you experience it in school, maybe all... all Leaders sometimes do struggle with abuse and authority. We know that. Now let's talk about this. What is abuse? Let's define it real quick. It's really important. Abuse is this. It is defined as any action that intentionally harms or injures another person. Intentionally harms or injures another person. Now some obvious areas of abuse are physical abuse and sexual abuse. Okay, let me tell you this right away. If you're experiencing any of that, get out from under the leadership. You should not, be, even the world doesn't tolerate this, right? Um, sexual abuse or physical abuse. Now these are very easy to detect because it's real obvious. If someone's physically uh, been abusive, there's bruises, or you know if you've gotten to a physical altercation, right? Um, sexual abuse, you know if someone's touched you inappropriately, or if you're in a sexual relationship with a leader, right? These are real obvious. But some other ones that aren't necessarily so obvious are things like, psychological abuse, verbal abuse, spiritual abuse, emotional abuse. Now these can be a little tougher to detect and the reason why they're not as black and white as the first two like I shared, sexual abuse and physical abuse. They're not as black and white. The reason why they're not is because a lot of times these ones, they're filtered through someone's past experiences. What someone considers verbal abuse, someone else, ah, that's not that bad. What, but what someone else considers emotional abuse, someone else, they may not think it's emotional abuse. Why? Because based off our past experiences in our family and how we've grown up. However, it's important. We still know. That's why we have to address what abuse is. And remember, it's any action that intentionally harms or injures another person. And here's the thing. The Bible does talk about leaders that become abusive. One of the best leadership chapters, full chapters in the whole Bible, is Jeremiah 23. And it's God addressing ministry leaders that abuse their power. And remember what happens? What did he say he's going to do? These shepherds, they weren't caring for their sheep. So he said he's going to take these sheep and put them under godly people. And that will happen when someone is under abusive leadership. So 
like I said, this type of question is a very complicated question because there's so many different types of scenarios. There's so many different types of examples, different, uh, different areas. But I do want to encourage you with this. Number one, I want you to pray and ask God what to do. I want you to go to God and ask him because so many times people, when they go through any difficulty or any hardship or they're feeling like they're under some abuse, they want to just leave right away or they want to throw in the towel and walk away rather than work through the issues rather than go through what needs, because like I said, a lot of people avoid confrontation. They don't want to work through the issues, but we need to aim to work through issues first before leaving, okay? So I do want to encourage that. Fight for unity. Fight to bring understanding. Fight to bring healing, um, especially when it's areas like if you feel like someone's being verbally abusive or you feel like maybe there's a little bit of emotional abuse going on. Now, I'm not talking about sexual sin, okay? I'm not talking about physical abuse. Get out from under that leadership right away, okay? I'm talking about some of these other areas, gray areas that are hard to detect. Ask God what to do. He will lead you and he will guide you. Number one, he may tell you what Matthew 18 says. It says, if someone offends you, it says, go to them. Go. There is so much healing that takes place when that happens, especially with ministry leaders sometimes, because sometimes someone will be hurt by something a leader says, and that leader didn't even realize they hurt them. Okay, so that's why it's so important. Um, Maybe you took something the wrong way. Have you ever had that happen where someone read a text message or someone read an email or, or someone took something the wrong way that you didn't even mean for them to take it, but you're glad you found out rather than just hold it in and rather let it eat someone alive. It's, you're glad you found out because you were able to say, I didn't mean that at all. So reconciliation is key. So Matthew 18 says, go to them. If they don't receive it, it says, bring a friend, right? Bring someone else, a witness to address it. And then it says, if they still don't receive it, what does it say? Go to the leaders of the church. Let the leaders deal with it. Let the other pastors deal with it. And that's why I love accountability is huge and it's a good thing. And let me tell you, if there's still not reconciliation that takes place after you've done these steps, after you've prayed about it, after you have gone to them, if you felt like you were led to go, go to them to bring this issue up, go to the leaders and ask them, the other pastors of the church, whether it's the, you know, this, whether it's the, any of the pastors of the church, go to them and ask them for counsel, ask them for advice, ask them what you should do. They may lead you to switch ministry departments. Maybe you shouldn't be in this department, but you need to go to this department. They may even tell you it's time to go to another church in the city, or they may have another church they recommend, but go to them. God will speak to them. God will lead you through them on what to do and hand, how to handle this situation effectively. Number three, I want to say this, refrain from gossip. Gossip kills ministry teams. It kills churches. It just, it hurts. It wounds. Gossip is so damaging. Avoid gossip. And that's why I want to tell you too, don't go to a lot of people for counsel, for guidance that aren't equipped to guide you. Don't go to someone that can never help the situation. Because when you're doing that, you're just spreading a negativity. You're just spreading sin. You're spreading rebellion. And that's exactly what the enemy wants. Only go to those that can give you godly wisdom. Only go to those that can pour into you, that can pray for you, that pray you through this. Only go to those. Okay. Look at Romans chapter 12. It says, never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see that you are honorable. I love that. Let that sink into your heart. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you are honorable. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil with good. Question number four. The question is, do you ever correct a pastor? (laughs) This is a good one, right? Do you ever correct a pastor? Can I tell you something? Yeah, accountability is good. I love other ministry leaders need to hold other ministry leaders accountable, right? Pastors hold pastors accountable. And a lot of times they have set up leadership. There is structure, right? There's the elders, there's the board, there's the denominational leadership. So yes, accountability is good. Accountability is a great thing to have, okay? But you may be wondering, well, I'm not a pastor, or maybe you're not a ministry leader. Could I still go to my leader? Can I still? And again, this could is a very broad question because you're talking about correcting theology, or you're talking about correcting mannerisms or lifestyle choices, or, or what, you know, it, it could be a difficult one to answer. But I do want to say this, pray about it. Go to God and ask him if you should go to them. Now, let me say this. 
Yes, feel free. You should be able to go to your pastor about anything. You should be able to go to your ministry leader about anything. You should always have that open door to go to your pastor. Remember, they love you. They care for you. Don't ever think anything different than that. But I do want to encourage you, pray about it. There's been times over the years that I have had questions about things, and I went to the Lord to pray about, is this something I should bring up, or is this something you know, I should go to my pastor about? And a lot of times, the Holy Spirit has said, no or don't worry about it, or I'll take care of it. And you know what? I have seen him do that time and time again. God has a way of dealing with his leaders. And I could say, share that firsthand as a leader myself. God has dealt with me in areas of theology where I was off. He has dealt with me um, when I've needed to deal with areas of pride in my life. He has dealt with me when I needed to grow as a leader. So trust me, God knows how to deal with his leaders and he does it. He does it very effectively. But if the Holy Spirit leads you, to go talk to them. Go talk to them. Please go talk to them. But let me give you a little bit of wisdom on how to do that. Number one, I wouldn't go with the attitude of, you know, I'm going to go correct my pastor right now. Okay? (laughs) I wouldn't do that because that's pride. That's arrogance. Rather, I would approach it in a spirit of humility, seeking understanding and seeking clarity. Go there asking questions as opposed to stating facts. Okay? I want you to think about it. Go asking questions to seek clarity, to seek understanding, rather than addressing facts. Because you do not have the full picture. You don't have all the understanding. So that's why go for understanding. Also, I want to tell you this. Do it in a respectful manner. One verse that I think about all the time is 1 Timothy chapter 5. Look at this. It says, Never speak harshly to an older man, but appeal to him respectfully as you would your own father. And it goes on to say, and to older women, treat them and speak to them like you would your own mother. So when you're talking about spiritual fathers and you're talking about spiritual mothers in the church, speak respectfully or to other ministry leaders, just speak, never speak harshly. This will help you when you're talking with a ministry leader. If you always address ministry leaders with this attitude, you will maintain and protect your honor. And I've also learned this, that when you share and go to them in a heart of honor and humility, what you are saying is more likely to be received than coming with an attitude of pride and arrogance, right? I have seen people go with pride and arrogance and everything they say gets thrown out the window because it was filtered through pride and arrogance, even though they may have been saying some true things. So you never want to go in that attitude or that honor. Lastly, let me say this, please, please, please don't post on social media, disagreements, or post correction of a ministry leader of a church on social media. Don't do that, (laughs) okay? Go to them. Why would we do that on social media? For the world to see. We're doing more damage than good. Please don't partake in that, okay? Question number five. The question is, what if I'm not getting fed at my church? (laughs) You ever heard that one before? What if I'm not getting fed from my church? Now, can I tell you this? You know who I normally have heard this statement from? It's from older believers. I never hear this from a new believer. I never hear this from someone that just got saved, you know, a couple weeks ago or a couple months ago. No, this is always someone that's been in the church for a long time. I'm just not getting fed anymore. Can I say something in love? Please, please, please (laughs) feed yourself. I want to say that again. Feed yourself. Imagine if someone only ate once a week, they only ate Sunday breakfast. They didn't eat lunch, dinner. They didn't eat Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. They only ate once a week. Can I tell you something? They're not going to be healthy. They're not going to be strengthened. They're not going to be nourished. And that's a problem we have right now is many are not nourished, right? We have a lot of anorexic Christians in the church. So we need to fix this. Um, Look at what um, the author of Hebrews says. Look at this. You have been believers so long now that you ought to be teaching others. Wow. (laughs) You you have been believers so long now that you ought to be teaching others. I want to encourage you. Now is the time you should be leading a small group in your church. Now is the time you should be leading a Bible study through your church or teaching. You should be doing that. You should be pouring into others now. And let me tell you this. When you go to church, your your whole focus shouldn't be to just 
eat the word there or just go for the sermon. No, no, no. You're going there for worship. You're going there for fellowship. You're going there to take part in communion. You're going there to serve, right? You should be serving at your church and you're going there to take part in the word. Amen. And I want to encourage you, please, please, please read the key number 12, honor the word because you have to start feeding yourself. You have to start getting in your word daily and nourishing and strengthening yourself. When you do this, then what's gonna happen? You're gonna start teaching others. You're gonna start training others. And you're not just gonna rely on Sunday morning. And sometimes God, what I've noticed, sometimes you will stop receiving because he wants you to start getting in your word more, okay? And, and, then, and when you start going back to your Sunday morning services, go expectant too, let me tell you that. This has really helped me. If I've ever gone through a, a season, where maybe I felt like I wasn't being fed, go expectantly. Today, I'm going to receive from the Lord. Today, I'm going to receive from the message being taught. By going in faith like that, oh man, God has blown me away. Sometimes it's one verse my pastor teaches, or it's one principle, and I'm just like, wow, and God just downloads things in my heart, revelation. He'll do that with you. Go expectantly. Next question. Question number six. The question is, what do I do if my spouse doesn't want me to attend, serve, nor give to my church? <laughs> Great question. Let me tell you this. Do it anyways. Go to your church, serve, and give. Why? Because that is what the Word says. We're called to submit to the Word. Okay, now a lot of times when you hear statements like this, it's when someone is with an unbelieving spouse. This is very common when someone's with an unbelieving spouse. And this can go both ways. But like I was saying earlier, you never compromise the word. Okay? I want to just share with you a powerful principle in this portion of Scripture. 1 Peter chapter 3. It's, it is amazing. Look at this. And, and these principles go both ways. But let's read this. In the same way, you wives must accept the authority of your husbands. Then... Even if some refuse to obey the good news, your godly lives will speak to them. Wow. Without any words, they will be won over by observing your peer and reverent lives, your respectful lives, your heart of honor. Okay, so even though you still go to church, even though you're still be faithful to the word, you, at home, you're still honorable, you're still respectful, even if your spouse is an unbeliever, even if your spouse isn't supporting your call in your life. No, you're still being respectful in the home and your godly life will speak to them if you have a heart of honor. Look at verse five. This is how the holy women of old made themselves beautiful. They put their trust in God and accepted the authority of their husbands. For instance, Sarah obeyed her husband, Abraham, and called him her master. You are her daughters. Look at this. When you do what is right, without fear of what your husbands might do. Wow, do what is right without fear of what your spouse might do. And it goes on to say, in the same way, you husbands must give honor to your wives. And this goes both ways. There needs to be honor in the home. If you're with someone that's not supportive of the call of God in your life, you still, you still serve, you still go to the church. Why? Because the Bible says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. So you still go to church. You still give. The Bible says give and support your church, now, especially if you're working and you have income, give. Now, even though your spouse may not fully agree or support, you tell them, I love you. I love you, honey, but I need to do this because I'm a child of God and this is what the word tells me to do. But I still love you. I honor you. I'm still going to serve you here at the house. Now, this goes both ways, but you be the godly person. God has called you to be in your house. And what does the Bible say? Your godly lives will speak to them. The next question, question number seven. The question is, when is honor too much? When does honor turn into idolatry? Okay, this is a good question right here, right? When does it cross the line? When does it go too far? Let me tell you this. It goes too far, number one, when you start to obey your leader over Jesus. Okay, I'm gonna say that again. It goes too far when you start to obey your leader over Jesus. In recent years, we have seen cult leaders, right? Cult leaders have risen up. And what happens? They start distorting the word of God and, and mass followings follow them. And they'll even follow them away from Jesus. And they won't even know it a lot of times because they're deceived. And this is why I'm so passionate about 
always saying, get in the word. You have to know the word yourself, because if you don't know the word, you will blindly follow a leader that is not serving God. That can happen. So that's why you got to get in the word. You got to know your word. An example of idolatry would be, let's say, you know, I love my pastor, but let's say my pastor stood up on church this Sunday and said, you know what? Some of the core foundational beliefs that we have taught here as this church, you know, the last 20, 30, 40, 50 years, I don't really believe them anymore. I'm going to go down the street and start my own church. And you know what? I don't really believe Jesus is the son of God. You know, he was a good prophet though, but I'm going to go down and start my own church. You know what? Some people would probably follow him. You know why? Because they don't know the word. They would blindly follow him. That's idolatry. They're putting their faith and trust in him when it's not based in the word. Now, I would say, I would say, pastor, I love you. I'm going to pray for you, but I'm not going to go with you. Now, isn't that what Paul said? Remember Paul said, he said, follow me as I follow Christ. Don't ever forget that. That's 1 Corinthians 11. Follow me as I follow Christ. A second thing to look for is when you honor your ministry leader more than you do your spouse. Okay? That's when things start to get unbalanced. Let me say that again. It's when you honor your ministry leader more than you do your spouse. So I don't want you serving your church, serving your pastor, serving your ministry leader, all out honoring them, but going home and not serving at home not helping out at home, not helping out your spouse with what they need to be done. No, 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 no. Yes, you should be serving your pastor. You should be serving in the church with your whole heart and soul, but equally at home, you should be doing it. When things get unbalanced is when people treat their spouse lesser or they go home and they don't serve in home. That's something to look forward to when things start to get a little unbalanced. Another thing, don't show your ministry leader double honor and financial appreciation and, and acknowledging them on their birthday, their holidays, anniversaries, and not do the same for your spouse. Okay? No, you need to show honor to your spouse. I hope that helps, gives you just a little bit of insight on some things to look forward to. The next question, question number eight. The question is, I'm not sure how to help build my leader's ministry. Or the question is, I'm not sure what to do. How do I build my leader's ministry? Okay, first thing I want to tell you to do. Number one, ask God for wisdom. James chapter one, verse five says, if you lack wisdom, it says, ask God. He'll give it to you graciously. Okay, that's the word of God. That's a promise. If you need wisdom on what to do, how to help your ministry go to another level, how to serve your leader, go to God and just say, God, I know I'm called to do this, but I don't know what to do. Lord, I'm asking for wisdom from you. You said you will pour it on me. You'll give it to me graciously. So Lord, I'm asking for ministry. No, I'm asking for strategic ideas. I'm asking for heavenly wisdom right now, Lord, and believe you'll receive it. And you watch the next couple days as God begins to pour down. So go to him expectantly in faith, asking for wisdom. The second thing I wanna encourage you is look for others who have done well in your ministry. Maybe look at other churches who have done really well in your ministry department and get ideas from them. I had just two of my team members recently do this. One of the ministries I'm over at the church is the home group ministry, the small groups here at my church. Well, two of my team members looked at other churches and got some ideas on what we can do and how we can grow our ministry. And you know what? They found great ideas and they shared them with me. And I'm so excited that they were doing this research, that they were searching out ideas. And you know what? And we've been able to implement these ideas. So do that. Number one, ask God for wisdom. Number two, look for others in your field that are doing things better than you and get ideas from them. Number nine. So the question is, how do I not get burnt out in ministry? Okay, this is a good question. How do you not get burnt out in ministry? You have probably seen a lot of people start serving strong and then they don't endure. They're there every week in serving or they're helping out in different ministry departments and they get burnt out. I'll never forget when I first started serving my pastor that first year, you know, I was serving. It felt like all the time, 24, seven, 360 days a year, 365 days a year, right? That's what it felt like. And, and I loved it. God had called me for that season to serve my pastor wholeheartedly and passionately during that season. And I'll never forget, uh, another ministry leader pulled me aside and said, said, Gary, you know, I'm, I'm a little concerned how much you're serving. And um, he said, I don't want you to burn out. And at the rate you're going now, you're going to burn out. And I re listened to him and I respect this ministry leader, but on the inside I knew mm, something was off. 
because I had learned something several years prior, a principle, and that is, number one, the Bible says in Hebrews, God is a consuming fire. So when people burn out, you know what happens? It's because they get disconnected from the fire. Now, here's the thing. In ministry, you will get a lot of priorities. You will get a lot of priorities. You're going to get a lot of tasks. You're going to get a lot of things you need to do. But can I tell you something? Don't ever lose sight of your first priority. Your first priority daily is your time spent with the Lord. Never neglect that, okay? He is the consuming fire. If you stay in Him, if you make time to get in His presence, to get in His Word daily, you will never burn out. I promise you that. But when people burn out is when they start doing all these tasks and they get so busy, but they neglect this first priority, they neglect this first task. And sure enough, they burn out. And that ministry leader that addressed me, unfortunately, I did see him burn out. So let me tell you, stay connected to the fire and God will give you the grace for the season you're in right now. But your number one priority, get in his presence every single day. Question number 10. The question is, what if I disagree with my pastor's decision or if I feel they are making a wrong decision? Is there anything I can do? Yes, absolutely. Can I tell you this? You can go to your ministry leader. You can share your heart with them. If there's been times over the years, I've gone to my pastor. Maybe I had questions about a certain decision or I felt like maybe we were making a decision we shouldn't have made. I would, you can go to your ministry leader. There's been times my pastor has asked me what I thought about this decision or that decision and how, what, and how he thought I should handle that. Or, or he asked me what I thought and I would give him my honest opinion on what I thought. So let me tell you, you can go to your ministry leader. But let me give you a couple things. Before going to your leader, ask yourself these three questions. Number one, are you acting in a spirit of honor? Number one, always before going to them, are you acting as, remember what I shared in 1 Timothy 5, never speak harshly to an older man, but appeal respectfully. So approach and honor. The second thing, let me ask you, are you bringing solutions? Okay, remember most people, they just bring problems. Most people, they just bring up uh, uh, problems that are happening and they don't bring solutions. Stating the obvious issues is entirely unhelpful unless you have potential solutions. Remember, King David, he went to Saul. He didn't just state the problem. No, no, no. He said, I'll help solve the problem. And he went and killed Goliath. He took ownership of it. So when you go to your leader, let me encourage you that. Also be willing to take ownership to help make the change, to help bring the change. And thirdly, let me ask you this. Have you earned the right to share your opinion? Okay, let me ask you that again. Have you earned the right to share your opinion? Throughout the years, I have seen people that don't serve faithfully, that don't give, that are not helping, uh, you know, the vision of the church, and yet they want to share their ideas, and they want to share why this is wrong and how we, we think we should do this instead of that. And can I tell you something? Their words fall flat. Their words don't have any weight. Why? Because they're not invested. They're not serving themselves. They're not giving to the vision of the church. But those that do serve, those that do give, those that are honorable in the house. You know, their words have weight. And when they speak, people listen. You know, we see this in the Bible. Look at Esther. Esther served King Xerxes. David served King Saul, right? Joseph served Potiphar. Daniel served King Nebuchadnezzar. Nehemiah served King Artaxerxes. And each one of them had a voice. Each one of them had influence. Why? Because their lifestyle, their words. Why? Because their words were backed by a lifestyle of honor. They all had words, they all had influence because of honor. And I wanna encourage you, if your leader makes a decision that you don't fully agree with, you know, maybe it's the direction of the church or maybe it's a ministry idea, I wanna tell you to support the decision. Don't go around spreading negativity on why you think it shouldn't happen. For those of you that watch, have watched football, you see when the team comes together and huddles, the quarterback calls the play right? Not everyone in that circle, not every one of them necessarily agrees that that's the best play to run. But you know what they do? They all run that play a hundred percent. Why? Because that was the play that was called. And you know what I've noticed? When everyone on the team runs the play a hundred percent, miracles happen. Why is that? Because God honors unity. Remember the Tower of Babel? These were unbelievers that were walking in unity, but they were able to do the impossible because of unity. So remember this, God honors honor. Next question, question number 11. 
What if my ministry leader doesn't let me use my gift? Good question. What if my ministry leader doesn't let me use my gifting? First off, I want to encourage you to talk to your ministry leader. I want to encourage you to go to them. Tell them what you feel you're called to do. Maybe you haven't done this already. Share with them what you feel your calling is, what you feel your gifting is. They would love to hear it. They need to know. Okay, share your heart with them. Secondly, tell them or ask for their wisdom. Ask for their advice on how you can grow in this area. Okay, they will tell you um, how you can grow. Let them know you respect their counsel. You want to be developed. You want to be raised up under them. Um, And also let them know you're not looking to rush anything. I'm not looking to make this happen right now. I just wanted to share my heart with you and I want to ask for your guidance. I want to ask if you could help pour into me and train me in this area. The second thing I would do too is ask them, what is the need right now? What's the biggest need in the church? How could I serve the most right now? Because this speaks volumes of a person when they're willing to help with the need, whatever it is. Maybe it's not in the area of the ministry they want to serve in during the season. Your ministry leader may say, I could really use you being a greeter right now. I can really use you being an usher. You know, I could really use you um, being a part of the choir right now, or I could really use you helping out with camera operating on the weekends. There's so many different areas, right? I could really use you in the cafe. And can I tell you this? God will use those seasons in those different departments. I have served in the bookstore. I have served in the media team, communications team. I have served in the coffee shop. I have served in several different areas. Can I tell you, a lot of these areas, I didn't feel were my ultimate calling. I didn't feel, you know, they were the main thing that I was called to do in the future. But I recognize that God's going to move me around all these different departments. And that's what God's going to do with you because he's going to mold you and he's going to shape you in those times. I'm telling you, he's going to develop things in you. It may be leadership lessons. It may be relational issues. He may teach you different things about different fields so that in the future, you're going to look back and be blown away. Because that's, I know right now, I look back, I'm like, man, I learned that in the media department. I learned that in the bookstore. I learned that traveling with pastor. I learned that through hospitality. Now I can see how God uses all those different seasons to develop you, to become the man or woman that God has called you to be. Last question, question number 12. What if I feel I've missed my calling? Okay, can I encourage you? Number one, Romans 11 says the gifting and callings of God are irrevocable. Don't ever forget that. God wants you to fulfill the calling on your life. I know you feel like maybe you've made choices, you have made mistakes, you're delayed, years have gone by, but I want you to be encouraged by these scriptures. Number one, Joel 2.25 says, I will restore to you the years the swarming locusts have eaten. God said, I'll restore to you. How amazing is that? I want you to hold on to these promises. Look at what Proverbs 6 says. If he is caught, if the enemy is caught, if the thief is caught, he must pay back seven times what he stole. Well, who's the thief? John 10, 10, right? says the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That's the enemy. That's the devil, right? If he has, you know, stolen years from your life or he has led you into sin, you can hold on to that promise in, Pro- in Proverbs chapter 6 that if he's caught, which he is, he'll pay back seven years. So I want you to believe that he's going to pay back seven times what he stole. Also, one of my favorite scriptures, it's when David, you know, David blew it. You know, he went down a road he should not have gone down, committing adultery. He, uh, then he tried to cover up murdering uh, her husband, right? It was a bad deal. But you know the story. He repented. He was a man after God's own heart, and he went to the Lord broken and repentant. And I love what I see in Psalm 72. He says this. He said, you will restore me to even greater honor. You will restore me to even greater honor. I want you to hold on to that and believe that for your life. And the last scripture, which has been, I feel like this is the best scripture on the subject of honor, which is the theme scripture of this course, 2 Timothy chapter 2. It says, therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy and useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. You cleanse yourself from dishonor and you will be a vessel of honor and you'll be useful and ready for the master of your house. Amen. I love you guys. I honor you. I I pray and hope you've gotten so much out of this course. It has been the utmost honor to teach and to pour into you. I hope you're inspired to serve like never before. And from the bottom of my heart, I just want to say thank you. 
Thank you, thank you for serving your church, serving your ministry leaders, serving with the heart of honor. Thank you for everything you're doing to reach your city. I love, I honor, and I appreciate you.